What's up, Hoss? How are you doing? We are here for our Secret Teachings of Jesus episode. Um, tonight we are in the Gospel of Philip, and the portion that we are going to be reading is called The Name of the Father. Uh, if you are new to this playlist or this segment or this channel, uh, this is our Saturday Night Secret Sermon where I delve into the Gnostic Gospels and some of the other things of that nature. And um, I just kind of pick out a passage that stands out to me and I read it out loud and then I kind of give me the downloads that are coming to me. Um, I'm not like a theologian or anything. And I basically, the reason I'm doing this is because I just wanted to read the Gnostic Gospels. But you know, life's full and busy and then there's building the channel and making content and I was like oh my gosh well why don't I just make it like a weekly episode where we are all exploring and learning together so yay so you know take this with a grain of salt but I don't know everything all the episodes so far have felt really valid and true and uh and sometimes I'll even read something later that'll confirm my hunches so you know that's, uh, that's what that is. <laughs> a little caveat. Um, all right. Well, um, we usually do this after midnight. That is kind of a magical point in the day. Um, it's, you know, after the, it's like the ending of one, you know, period and the beginning of another. Uh, but tonight I am unexpectedly off work. I took a delicious cut tonight and I've been doing whatever I want all day and it's been awesome and um, yeah, it's everything I ever dreamed of. So, all I ever wanted, all I ever needed. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna pause for one second and come right back. I had an out of place eyelash that I knew would bother me for the rest of the video. So, all right, I'm back. I survived it. <laughs> the harrowing tell harrowing journey. Okay, <clears throat> so the portion uh, that we're in tonight from the Gospel of Philip is called The Name of the Father. And I, what I can tell you about the Gospel of Philip is that it's like this book of small portions of cryptic text that are meant to be pondered and meditated upon. Um, and then, you know, they unfold themselves in layers over time. Some of the other things, like we looked at the, um, we looked at it, we read the secret book of James, um, that was last year and it was more scene driven, a lot of dialogue. That was a fun one. Um, this one has been heavy and dense and thick, but also very enjoyable. I've liked every episode. So, and it's funny too, because I think that the portions that we end up getting usually end up lining up with like the energy of the week. Um, at least from a Kabbalistic perspective, like when you, if you follow, this would be very obscure. Um, but if you happen to keep up with like whatever the daily Zohar portion is of the week, uh, which is the like Old Testament portion of the day um, that coincides with the energy of the day. And sometimes they line up. So I think that's really, really cool too. So, you know, just a lot of um, just following our intuition here. Uh, yeah, so with no further ado, oh, that's right. I was talking about midnight being a magical time of day. Yeah, it's this limbo, it's this, space um where it's you know it's the ending of one thing and the beginning of another so it's like this zero kind of destiny point where the wheel is turning and it's also the seed level of the beginning of the new day and so whereas like in the darkest like later hours of the day those are the most negative times of night it's good to be studying sacred texts like this because um pondering the goodness of and the glory of God um, and the creator at this time of day and declaring it, declaring God's goodness, it always puts this shroud of protection over you. Um, King David was not supposed to live past like a kind of an, a young age, 
but he lived an extra um, several decades uh, be and he prayed like every day, uh, like twice a day, you know, like all through the day had, you know, the books of the Bible that he wrote were like prayers that we still pray that David wrote. Um, but it was like, he would always pray and be grateful for every day, every extra day of life that he had. <clears throat> so, um, but he would stay up at midnight and pray and push himself to stay awake through those negative hours to kind of get extra protection over his soul. And then he would go to sleep during the positive hours. And so the soul like ascends from the body at night in sort of a miniature version of temporary death. And it experiences sort of like a miniature judgment day where it goes through a daily, um, you know, ritual of cleansing and renewal and death and rebirth. So it's really quite normal, but you know, we are left vulnerable without the protection of our soul at this, you know, at the late hours of the night. So um, some of the Kabbalists would, uh, they would study and they would sleep for like the negative hours and they would get up and they would study again, you know, um, through the most positive hours and through the date, you know, the latest parts of the night um, to add extra protection and everything like that. So, um, and then the magnification of the seed level energy of the beginning of the day, these are the most positive hours. So the early hours of the day, like leading up to noon, this is the growing light. Think about the same pattern as the new moon and the waxing cycle. It's the same idea of how the light uh, wanes and waxes through the day. Or sorry, the waxing cycle from the new moon waxing cycle to becoming cycle. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of reasons why it is beneficial to um, study at this time of night, but it adds extra protection. It helps us ground the lesson that we're learning in a way that, like there's the surrounding light this time of night that helps us ground the lesson that we're learning without having to go through a complicated process to play it out and embody it. Um, so that is helpful. Uh, yeah, so let's get started, like, as I say again. The name of the Father. Only one name is not pronounced in the world. The name the Father gave the Son. It is the name above all. It is the Father's name. For the Son would not have become the Father if he had not put on the Father's name. Those who have this name understand it, but do not speak it. Those who do not have it cannot even understand it. So let's read that one more time. The name of the Father. Only one name is pronounced in the world. Oh, sorry. Only one name is not pronounced in the world. The name the Father gave the Son. It is the name above all. It is the Father's name. For the Son would not have become Father if he had not put on the Father's name. Those who have this name understand it, but do not speak it. Those who do not have it cannot even understand it. So the name that they are referring to, I believe, um, is the Tetragrammatron, which is the yud he vav he. This is the name of God that we do not pronounce because it is so holy and so pure that it reveals so much light that it can yield chaos if taken out in vain or out of context or used, in, used inappropriately. Uh, the Tetragrammatron is the name when people say the word Yahweh, uh, it is that means Lord. And so this is the purest version of God in God's most abstract form of beingness. It's the wholeness of the light in its totality and unity. It is the all. And so the, the name 
and the utterance of the name was the birth of the incarnation, the physical expression, the first becoming of nothing that expressed the identity of the light of the creator, the I am that I am. So the these four Hebrew letters and their numerical value hold the key to the inner wisdom and power of the cosmos. So it is not taken lightly. It's something to be meditated on. Um, you know, visually scanning the letters can be very powerful if you are scanning those in prayer and meditation. Um, like the literal Hebrew letters, like if you go and look up the Hebrew letters for that and you scan them like with your eyes from right to left, uh, that's a form of visual meditation. There's actually 72 names of God that are combinations of three letters. Um, there's a chart of them and it is something that r ritualistically during prayer connections, prayer meditation connections, at least through the Kabbalah Center, uh, we scan the chart of the Hebrew letters of the names of God at certain points of the, the process. Um, I do it during in my prayer practice twice a day. But each name has a different numerical value. Each name has a certain power that you can draw from or connect with or the power of support or consciousness in this way by scanning these letters. The letters themselves have this essence and this frequency and this vibration. They're the building blocks of reality. And they are the essence of the expression of the utterance of the creator of the light, the first root level um, building blocks, you know, let there be light. This is the first language, this is the original alphabet. So, circling back the name of the father only one name is not pronounced in the world the name the father gave the son so think about how in the cosmos when something is cosmically true it's it's like a mythical truth that is so true that it's be, true beyond literal material expression it's true beyond a factual event truth. It's true universally. And it's something that gets told over and over and over again. It's a perpetuated truth. So if the tetragrammatron is the first thing that the creator, the light, gave birth to in its expression and, in a, and as a, a sample of itself, then that is the first incarnation of the son of the thought like the coming of the son of god the father so um the name the father gave the son so in kabbalah we talk about the the universe having two core aspects light and vessel and so the light in its totality like there was no other, it was just unified. There was nothing to have an identity as a self because there was nothing outside, like the self wasn't contained within or outside of anything and there wasn't other. Deploying chart, <laughs> chart. So if this is the map of the cosmos and of the rea of reality, of, of all of reality, of all the 10 dimensions of reality and consciousness and the human soul, this is the Godhead, and this is the the 10 dimensions or the 10 governing forces of the Godhead. So at its purest form up here, actually, okay, so these three arcs here are the three negative veils of existence. So this is non-existence in more and more non-existing, non-existing E-ness. <laughs> So the limitless light is here in the first level of unbeing. And it's like all of it is gathering in this limitless sea of potential and unformed, 
unformed consciousness in like utter kind of chaos and formlessness. And so the light gathered into a like a singularity, a, a, a primordial point and burst forth and burst through and gave like wanted to share, wanted to give, wanted to express. And so there needed to be a vessel for the light to flow into. So there in that moment gave birth to the vessel. This was the, the feminine um, womb that contains reality here. So the light up here in Keter, this is its whole purest form without any dilution. This is the most abstractness of God in the first earliest stages of the crystallization of God's consciousness in its full totality and union. As it moves down this glyph, the light, it becomes, it goes through these filters so that it is toned down for us to be able to contain. This down here, this is the universe. This is Malchut. This is the, the multiverse. This is everything that we don't know um, about outer space and the, the multi-mega, multi-mega, megaverse. I don't know even what there are two nowadays. They're probably like, there's a multi, 10 times, 100 times the multiverse, multiverse, within the multiverse now, who knows? So, but yes, all of that, anything that's physical, incarnation manifestation is happening here in the kingdom and so it goes through these dimensions of fine-tuning and refining into more specificity as it crystallizes and it takes shape and form into the physical as it becomes more dense and more crystallized we're losing that intensity of the purity of the light but we can't, we couldn't take it all. It would be too much. We would be obliterated. We would be completely absorbed back into the all. So there would be no physical indivis uh, individual consciousness. So as it moves down, there are these different levels. And so this is the divine masculine. The, the energy first goes into the divine masculine where it's this pure, you know, unadulterated energy, fire, but, you know, desire, um, you know, dynamic um, energy, dynamism, then that is useless. It's just creating perpetual chaos and um, destruction. So it needs shape. It needs form. It needs something to hold it, to contain it, to give it boundary, to give it shape and, and direction. Uh, and discipline and restriction. So it go. This is the divine masculine. It goes here and is received by the divine feminine, the vessel. So the metaphor for the universe is light and vessel. All of this becoming and preparing for the ultimate us vessel to receive the light. This is the same process that we go through trying to prepare our vessel to receive the light and our consciousness. So as the, the light prepares itself to enter the vessel, we ourselves prepare the vessel to meet the light and have, create affinity with the light. And so according to the law of affinity, law of like, um, you know, uh, of attraction, it's like like attracts like. If we vibrate and become like the light, then we vibrate with the light, then we harmonize with the light, then we put ourselves in the flow of miracles. If we are not having affinity with the light, then we are like our vessel is broken and we can't contain the light and we're not in affinity with the light. And so we can't channel miracles and enlightenment and revelation. So the Tetragrammatron is the physical utterance, the acknowledgement it's the referring to God at this level, at this state, before God has to water itself down for us to understand, right? Because as it comes down into these levels, it's not until like here that, that God starts to take on anthropomorphized in the human mind. Well, I guess that's not true because it's depicted as like, like a soldier 
and a king, like, and, 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 uh, and this is like the Greek gods and the muses and these symphonies and, and inspiration. This is like numbers, calculation, sciences, um, ritual for meticulous technicality, right? Whereas this is being like inebriated with spirit, you know, being like inspired, taken by desire, inebriated by it. These come together in this realm here. This is where the sacral chakra is, but this is Yasad. This is where dreams are. Um, this is where the astral realm is, but this is where we, from our physical consciousness, reach up and connect to that kind of um, non-physical realm for the first time here. So it all kind of meets us here. And this is the storehouse. So this is where we, our cup is filled from. This is, is it Joseph or Jacob that became the head of the storehouse of Egypt and was in charge of giving the flow. Um, the moon is associated with this, uh, uh, this realm. You find, uh, you connect with your soulmate through this realm. Uh, this is the realm of imagination. Um, there are, there, there is like astral projection and things like that happen in this realm. Um, what is, is it astral projection or was it remote viewing? Like that is the, the travel that goes through here. But the astral realm is actually, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, malicious beings there too. So it's not a very safe place to be if you're not protected psychically. But this is where dream, the dreams happen and uh, our nightly dreams are. Um, and then thy kingdom come here is all of this, the light of God actually coming into form in the physical world here. Um, before Adam and Eve had the fall of their consciousness, they were here in this realm here. And it was like this, this bosom of paradise, this limbo. And it wasn't a full physical manifestation here in the physical kingdom until they fell and were kind of separated from the bosom of the light of the creator from that direct connection. See how this is just has like a further down. It's like it needs that bridge. So this was the fall. This was our separation from the creator. And so our process is to build the vessel, to prepare the vessel, to be able to have affinity with the light, to receive the light, to contain the light, right? We are the bride preparing ourselves for the bridegroom. So the name, the yud heh vav -he, is the first vessel to contain the identity of the I am that I am, the wholeness, right, that we can relate to, that is expressed. So that name also represents and contains within it the numerical value that expresses the association with this realm of the totality of the light and its wholeness and its fullness. And so only certain times of year during the high holidays is that energy more available, like the veil is drawn back and we're under a certain amount of protection. And even then, in most of those cases, we fast or we do things to prepare ourselves beforehand. We prepare the vessel. So let's read this again. Only one name is not pronounced in the world the name the Father gave the Son. It is the name above all. It is the Father's name. For the Son would not have become Father if he had not put on the Father's name. Those who have this name understand it but do not speak it. Those who do not have it cannot even understand it. Now, when we speak these things, one of the things that give us affinity with the light of the creator, with the creator, is our ability to speak, the, the ability to have words. And so our utterances are very powerful. They are basically spells and prayers all the time. And so we're either speaking blessings or curses at any given time. Our mouth is the, is the, has the power of life and death in our tongue. And so our, our words are actually creating thought forms in the astral realm that are getting ready to be burst forth into the physical realm. They have potential to come through. So we have to be careful about what we say and what our utterances are. And so to utter that name is to suddenly summon the full force of the light of the creator 
And if you're not intending, you have no intention with it. It's like you're inviting all this light that is now not grounded or embodied. It's just wild power, like ricocheting off of you, creating chaos. And so the other side wants to take stray energy as well, right? When we short circuit, when we break the vessel in our reactiveness, when we lose our connection with the light, when we momentarily have our fall, right? In any moment, we can be in the, in the, in the garden of Eden when we're, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we're having that inner peace and inner fulfillment and those moments of bliss and harmony. And then in a moment's notice, we can fall and we can separate from it. And then we can be in distress and misery and fear and lack and doubt. So, you know, these utterances, it's like, you know, when we, when we, when we, you know, have those moments of fall, it's like we break open the vessel and the light that was gathering around us, the light that we contained is then spilled out and, and the, and the, the opponent side grabs hold of those points, you know, that, that miracle juice. And the double whammy is that the, that's the first opponent, the, the masculine opponent, the feminine opponent comes back right after that and tries to make you feel shame and guilt and sorrow about it. And it takes double your energy, double your light for it. So, you know, speaking that name, it summons that power. And we don't want to take that name in vain because it's, it becomes dangerous. Uh, it can release all kinds of chaos. So, and we also don't want to, like, we want to hold that name sacred um, because it, it's all about connecting with our consciousness and having a reverence in moments where we connect with that and holding that holy and, um, and reverent. Uh, only one name is not pronounced in the world. The name the father gave the son. So this name that the father gave the son, the I am that I am. The I am that which I am becoming. That is our identity. This name, the name that we're given, that's the name that we identify with. That's the name that we come from. That's the name that bore us. That's the name that claims us, that takes care of us, that provides for us, that houses us, that shelters us, that loves us. That name is a name we share. Um, it's also our identity. It's what we identify with, a name, our name, right? Our individual name. So the name that the father gives the son, it's like, this is what I name you. This is the identity that I give you, that you claim. And so the person who has this name and bears this name and understands this name, it's like, this is the consciousness they choose to identify with. They identify with the consciousness of the creator, with the light of the creator. They are on the path of awakening their consciousness, their light, their revelation, their understanding. They're in the, on the path of awakening and elevating their soul. And so they bear that name. Now, that's the son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, like the, the physical human incarnation of the, the son of God um, or God's, you know, human incarnation was given the name. Um, it, it refers right now, it's like part of that is referring to the fact that they, they referred to Jesus as Lord um, and to, to reference him to the Tetragrammatron, to the, uh, to the Son of God, to the physical, earthly, human manifestation of someone who has come into union with affinity with the light of the Creator that has prepared a perfect vessel that can channel that light through and literally to the level of working miracles, to like instantly healing sickness, to raising, resurrecting the dead, to speaking something and having it physically transmute before the eyes, the turning of water into wine, the, um, you know, turning the, the fishes and loaves into the many fishes and loaves that fed the, the five, the crowd of 5,000 or whatever it was. So it's like the, the name given, they referred to Jesus as Lord because he was a master um, he had mastered uh, 
self-control, consciousness, restriction. He had built a perfect vessel. He was born through with one, you know, as the incarnation of the Christ, the level of consciousness here, the Christ. But up here, this is the Yahweh. This is the Tetragrammatron. And so to be given that name, Christ, that was the transcendence of Christ because this is the highest that we can be in our, in our human form. But once we go, and, and this is, you know, only Jesus has been the Christ, arguably, you know, um, in this in human incarnation. And so to go above and beyond this, at that point, you are rising beyond your humanity and you're shredding all, like you're shredding layers of your individuality because you're being reabsorbed into the all, like into that level of ascension the term ascended masters. It's like those who have, I, I, I want to say that the ascended masters, because most humans only go like Buddha is up to Yasad level. And so I think that most of the prophets and ascended masters are here. And maybe if they're ascended, they can go up higher, but I don't know if anybody else is. I can't, I, I, I don't have the authority to say, I don't have the education to say, but from what I understand, you know, here we go. So, only one name is not pronounced in the world. The name the Father gave the Son. It is the name above all. It is the Father's name. Uh, for the Son would not have become Father if he had not put on the Father's name. So, meaning the Son, um, Jesus the Christ, would not have ascended, transcended after his resurrection even higher into the upper realms and mysteries um, had he not taken on the Father's name, meaning had he not done... Okay, so Jesus did... Like, the Gnostic Gospels get pretty far out because Jesus has continued transcendence to go to in the upper realms and the upper mysteries once he resurrects, like, kind of, like, wraps things up with the disciples, goes over some new um, material and lessons, and then he's like, all right, I have work to do. I have to ascend now. So this is when Jesus is ascending to these upper realms and beyond. And so this, the name of the Father, like Jesus would not have been able to ascend even further than, than he had, and even as far as he had, had he not taken on the yoke, taken on the consciousness, taken on the perfection of the soul, the soul correction, uh, Jesus had perfect tikkun. He had no tikkun. He had no balancing needed. Everything was virtuous and in perfect balance. The um, the demons, um, like his, in, like the inner demons that we all struggle with in our humanity, had not defiled the purity of his consciousness yet. So he had pure faith without doubt. He had pure wholeness and belief of his wellness without any scarcity. He had no lack. Like. So the, the vessel was pure, it was, it was perfect, it was undefiled. Now, Mary Magdalene was a feminine vessel who chose as a human being to transcend and go to the, through the path of ascendance, uh, 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 to the path of, of ascension to transcend her own demons, which are the seven, um, these seven governing forces when out of balance um, or when they're not corrected within us, they hold power over us and they are, they pull at our darkness and these are the gaps where the opponent gets in. And so these are the, are the demons that we struggle with. But when we correct those things in our tikkun, when we rise above those fears and heal those wounds and grudges and doubts and, and we rise above them and they no longer control us and we learn how to embrace even that part of us where it has no it has no control over us, right? It's like almost like the metaphor of if somebody's going to blackmail you and pretend like you're a millionaire or billionaire and someone tries to like blackmail you and be like, I'm going to ruin you. I'm going to cancel you um, and I'm going to expose you and I'm going to reveal a secret about you. But if you're like, I'm sorry, I accept this about myself and I'm pretty sure that everybody else will too. So go ahead and say it because no one's going to give a shit. Then, they, then you just owned your demon, right? Like it has no power over you. You've transcended it. Like go ahead and try. Like I'm not going to pay you. Same. 
exactly the same. So as you transcend your demons, it's like you are re like you're you're taking your levels of consciousness through the purification process because when we're born they're pure, but through fears, conditioning, um patterning, things that we witness, trauma, it's like we take on these layers of tikkun of shell shells of negativity that we then have to um, and it, it, it's it, the term is that we are defiled by these powers, by the demons, right? So it defiles the purity of our connection with our naivete, with our trust, with our pure faith and essence that everything's going to be fine and that we're fine. And that we're not flawed. Like, oh, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm fine. I'm great. I'm perfectly lovable, you know? What if we grew up without any conditioning and we had the innocence, the, the purity of uh, an innocent newborn baby? Um, and the and the, also the know-how and the wisdom and the logic also and street smarts. Uh, but what if we went through all of these things and we still, we still had that ability to believe and trust to get excited without looking over our shoulder or dress rehearsing tragedy? Oh my God, how enjoyable, right? That is what it was like for Christ. That's why he had nothing blocking him from seeing someone's wholeness and like knowing that it was just like a given. And then they're all of a sudden, they're by his faith that he like elevated them in that moment and they were able to meet it and they got their healing. So he prepared the vessel. Um, okay, so for the son would not have become father if he had not put on the father's name. And so we will not become the father. We will not become the Christ if we don't put on the name, if we don't take on that identity, that, that ownership um, taken in by that as well, by God being our provider, source. Source is my provider, not my bank, not my job, you know, not my, um, you know, the romantic partner or not the friends, not the hobbies, not the vacation that's supposed to fill me up, like none of it. Like it's just source that I'm really connecting with. And so when I see that all of those things that I just named, they're just vessels for that light to come through. And it's really the light that I'm connecting with and they have no power over me either. And so then I can connect with them more freely, right? So those, um, so let's see, for the son would not have become father if he had not put on the father's name. Those who have this name understand it, but do not speak it. So, and those who do not have it cannot even understand it. So, I mean, yeah, think about a, just a normal average Joe just tuning into this conversation right now. They would be like, what is the fuck is happening? What is it? What are they on about? What, are they, what is going on? What are they talking about? You know, so that's just understanding the conversation, let alone starting to understand the depths of the layers of the metaphysics and the esoteric truth of what's happening underneath the surface of it all. So yes, so those who have this name understand it, but don't speak it. So those who have are taking on this yoke, those who have this identity, this, this, uh, this connection, this direct connection. They feel the power and they're not going to use it irresponsibly because they know that the correction, the direct like supervision of the light will come down and swat them. Swat them like with like uh, nuns with a ruler on your wrist. When you're connected as a student of spirituality, like the you're being, you're under direct supervision of the light of the creator. So if you abuse power or, you know, leave empty vessels, so to speak, when you use that name and you're not directing it in a, in a fashion toward um, an, an end, it leaves an empty vessel. And so the empty vessels gather chaos, right? Or the other side uses that energy. So, so those who understand that, they don't just use it lightly. They don't spend it around freely earning interest that they're going to have to pay back. They don't also take that name in vain because they have a deep connection and sacred intimate reverence uh, with that name. And so they understand and respect that power and they don't use the name of the Lord in vain very much anymore. You know, I, I think you should be very uh, careful about going around saying like, well, God told me this, God told me that, because it's like you are using the name in vain. 
you're putting your projections on what you're assuming. That's why I don't, I try not to use terminology that's, you know, to, I don't know, like I don't call myself a prophet. I'm not sitting here saying like I'm speaking the, the words of God, but I am divinating. I'm, I'm connecting with what I think is channeling, you know, messages from the light. But I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say that for sure. You know, I, I don't take that lightly at all, you know. And so I think that it's more responsible for me to just get on here and say what I need to and you can take or leave it, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that that's because I have learned enough to understand. And I'm like, oh, I would never be so presumptuous, you know, humility. And, you know, I would never, you know, say something like that so boldly because you're setting yourself up for something like a big fall, like pride cometh for a big fall. And that's one of those where I'm like, yeah, I would think twice before, you know, I would attach that, you know, take it in vain in that way. So I think that we have pretty much covered everything that I wanted to get at. And we are at our usual 38, 40 minutes. Uh, the name of the father and my knees are about to buckle because I've been sitting on them. So the name of the father, only one name is not pronounced in the world. The name the father gave the son. It is the name above all. It is the father's name for the son would not have become father if he had not put on the father's name. Those who have this name understand it, but do not speak it. They do not have it, or those who do not have it cannot even understand it. All right, y'all. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night and day and tomorrow and the next day and the week ahead. And tomorrow we will come back here tomorrow night for our weekly energy oracle forecast where we will take a look at the week ahead to see what the spiritual energy has in store for us. All right, y'all, be good, but not too good. Ciao.